morning. morning. Especially we welcome those of you following uh, following us online. And we welcome all our guests and visitors with us this morning. This is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it as we worship our Savior on this beautiful day with the Order of Matins, <clears throat> especially for our visitors. Our entire order of service is up on our screen to follow along with. All the hymns, the whole order, everything is there. Um, of course, you can always use the hymnals, no, no, no worries there. Um, but with that, just a few things. Uh, being we're going through Matins, Matins doesn't have the order of communion, so we insert the order of communion, which follows setting three. Um, and with that, our communion hymn, it's ten verses, and the tenth verse is a doxology verse where we stand up in reverence to our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also with communion, um, again, a reminder and to let any others know, we're going pew by pew when you come up, so each pew... We don't kneel, um, so we don't have to worry about sanitizing everything in between people. So you just stand here, and then I place the wafer, and then sanitize, and then I place the individual cup in your hands to keep everything safe and sanitary. And then offering a place in the basket, if you haven't done so already, on your Hymn 941, one of my favorites. Uh, that should be all the notes for our worship today as we begin worshiping our Savior in this beautiful morning with Hymn 587, I Know My Faith is Founded.
rise as you're able to do so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the tenth Sunday after Pentecost is from Job chapter 38. The Lord said to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick dar darkness its swallowing band? and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall you per your proud ways be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken." Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of the death been revealed to you, or have you been the gates, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this, 
This is the word of our Lord. The epistle for this morning is from Romans chapter 10. Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news! But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. We say to the joint, lifting our voices to the Lord with him, 831, how shall they hear who have not heard?
grace, mercy, and peace be to you all this morning from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Helper, the Holy Spirit. Amen. A lesson for consideration today comes from our continuation in the book of Romans. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear people of God. 1961, a visitor walked into the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery Museum in Glasgow carrying a brick. We found a painting of a crucifixion and started to destroy it. His anger, his violence, his desecration of Christian art, it wasn't done out of hatred for Christianity, but out of love for Christ. See, he objected to the way that the artists had betrayed the crucifixion of Jesus. Well, Salvador Dali was the artist, and the painting was Christ of St. John of the Cross. See, in it, one sees Jesus hanging on the cross over the world. See, the problem for the visitor, however, was one of perspective. Dolly had changed the traditional perspective that people had on the crucifixion. See, rather than standing and looking up at the cross, looking up into the face of Jesus, Dolly asked for a moment for the viewer to be situated above the cross, looking down upon Jesus, who is looking down upon the world. See, for the visitor, this stance was sacrilegious. You place, you're placing yourself above Jesus. But for others, however, this view of looking down upon Jesus is divine. Some people see what the visitor didn't see. They see an artist inviting you for a moment to have God's view of the world. Our Heavenly Father looks down upon a fallen world and he sees it through the eyes of his son Jesus dying on the cross for all people. This vision is hard even for us to see because, like I said, we don't want to place ourselves above Jesus. We don't want to place ourselves especially over his crucifixion, which is what saved us. But as we look to the world, we can often see something that we actually would rather run away from than run into. We see the social fabric of God's creation, creation tearing apart at the seams. The God's moral code that he has established for us is thrown out the window. And everyone can have a free-for-all, whatever they want to believe and whatever they want to do. So how easy is it for us then to enter the church, turn our eyes up towards the cross, and leave everything going on in the world behind? All we can see is Jesus and seeing him, we can forget where we are or what he would have us be doing. We can simply gaze up on the cross and imagine Jesus dying there for us and forget that we live in this sinful world and that God has actually chosen us to be involved in his mission. Right here, right now. How hard it is, how terribly hard to look at Dolly's crucifixion. See, here, we cannot escape looking at the world by looking at Jesus. No, we find that Jesus asks us to see the world through him. Something we've been focusing on is see the world through the eyes of Jesus. Now, how the world wants us to see, not how our own perspective sees it, but how Christ sees the world. So Jesus hangs there below us, offering his life for the whole world. And he invites us to see the world through the cross, living in God's mission of love. See, this is the perspective that Apostle Paul had upon the world. This is the vision Apostle Paul was inviting Christians in Rome and Christians today to see. God has called us to be a part of his people for his purpose, his purpose of reaching out to the ends of the earth with Christ's saving love. So this morning, as we reflect on this lesson for Romans, we will consider two details of Paul's vision of the people of God. We are people saved by grace and people involved in God's mission. See, one of the odd things about Dolly's depiction of the crucifixion is the body of Jesus. I know it's kind of hard to see in your seat, but if you would look closely at the painting, you notice that Jesus hangs on the cross without any wounds. There's actually no nails 
piercing his hands to the cross. There's no nails piercing his feet at all. His body hangs from the cross, but there is actually nothing there holding him to it. For some, you know, the detail's disturbing. It doesn't actually depict the real crucifixion. It makes it look like maybe the crucifixion never happened, and it denies the pain and suffering of the Son of God and everything he went through for our salvation. For others, however, there's a deep spiritual insight in this painting. When Jesus was crucified, we indeed, we indeed nailed him to the cross. His own people tried him, found him guilty of blasphemy, and rejected their God. And we would do the same if he would come among us today. There is no doubt that God himself was rejected by his people and hung upon the cross to die. But that is not the only reason that Jesus hung up upon the cross to die for us. Well, he could have delivered himself if he wanted to. Remember on the night when Jesus was betrayed, how Peter drew his sword to protect him? Jesus then turned to Peter and said, Do you not think that I could call upon legions of angels for my Father? And he will at once send me well, more than 12 legions of angels to protect me and help me. You know, when Jesus hung upon the cross, you know, the religious leaders mocked him. They called out for him to come down from the cross and save himself if he really, truly was God. But Jesus stayed on the cross. Not because he was only human and couldn't get down, but because he was truly God and wouldn't get down so he could save his people. See, Jesus stayed on the cross because he didn't come into his world to save himself. No, he came to save you. Every one of you. It was the pure love of God the Father that led Jesus to that cross. And it was the pure love of God that held Jesus up on that cross, offering his sinless life for the sins of the whole world. See, Jesus hanging on this cross without the nails is not a realistic picture of what happened at the crucifixion, but it's a true picture of what happened on that day. That God in Jesus Christ willingly gave up his life for you and for the world that we live in. And stayed on that cross by his own choice because of his love for us. And that is something the Apostle Paul understands. Salvation comes to us purely by grace. God's riches at Christ's expenses. It is only by the love of God poured out for us in Jesus Christ that we are saved. We are part of God's greater people. Nothing inside of us makes it by that. Nothing in our titles, nothing in our roles makes us God's greater people. It's all by His grace, His mercy, His love, His forgiveness. And as Paul proclaims this truth among the Roman Christians, he does so by revisiting a familiar text for God's people. Just as Dolly took a traditional picture of the crucifixion and offered a new insight into it, so Paul took a traditional text and asked God's people to hear it and read it again and see a different perspective. A college professor of mine did this so wonderfully. In the class he said, you know, you look at a Bible verse and then all of a sudden you read it a year later and you gain a different insight on it. It's like a diamond. You know, a diamond has many facets to it. It's not just one diamond. There's many facets to it. It's like a Bible verse. One Bible verse, even the Bible, shortest Bible verse in English. Okay, there's a shorter Bible verse in Greek, but we won't go there. The shortest Bible verse in, in English is Jesus wept. And even in that, there's so many different facets to it. Different angles, different perspectives, how you can read it, especially with what's going on in your life. So Paul turns to the book of Deuteronomy, takes God's people to Deuteronomy, the record of the covenant renewal among God's people. See, God's people are there on the edge of the promised land. After 40 years wandering in the wilderness, they are about to enter the land that God had promised them for decades. I mean, beyond the 40 years. And before they enter the promised land, God renews his covenant with them. In the beginning of that covenant renewal, God warns the people of Israel. 
He warns them about how they should view this moment. Moses says, Do not say in your heart after God has thrust the nations out before you. It's because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Moses continues, Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. See, Moses is asking them, telling them to look beyond their past. They were a stubborn people, and there is no way that they earned the promised land on their own doing. Well, at the end of the covenant renewal, God prophesies to the people of Israel. He speaks of a time when they will depart from God again, and they're going to be exiled from this good land that God is giving to them. And then God in mercy will come to them again, and they will repent, and God will bring a restoration. And we know this happened. And here, Moses is asking them to see their future. Their future lies only in the mercy of God. It is that vision of the future that Paul quotes here. Only as Paul quotes his vision, he has his own words for emphasis. Remember, God inspired Paul to write, so he wasn't adding to Scripture. He was writing Scripture for us. And he wants us to see the love of God freely given for all people now in Jesus Christ. For Paul, that day of restoration had come to God's people. Yes, historically it had come when the people were brought back from Babylon and rebuilt Jerusalem and Israel again. But Paul sees beyond that, just like Moses and even Isaiah pointing ahead. The day of restoration had come in Jesus Christ. It had come purely by grace. See, with these words, Paul reaches out to his Jewish brothers and sisters like we had talked about last week, invites them then to join with the Roman Gentile Christians in confessing salvation in Jesus Christ by grace through faith. We Lutherans didn't come up with that. We love to say it. We didn't come up with that. Paul told us that thousands of years ago. Because at the heart of God's covenant lies not what we do for salvation, but rather what God does for us. So guess what? Paul didn't even come up with that. God came up with that to save us by his grace through our faith that he bestows upon us in the Holy Spirit. See, we are not saved because we are mighty or numerous or because we have wealth or particularly holy people, or we're better than others out there. No, we are a stubborn and rebellious and sinful people before a holy, almighty God. And yes, we see our past and see where we come from. We don't forget our past, as in to deny what's happened. But we also look to our future, as we've talked about before a few Sundays. Because we know that we are saved by God's mercy and grace, made known for us in Jesus Christ. At the heart of God's restoration of all things lies the work of God in Jesus Christ. He came down from heaven, he descended into hell, and he rose again that we might be forgiven and be part of God's holy people who live by grace through faith. And as Paul offers a vision of life in the promised land, he helps us to see Jesus. But he also helps us to see Jesus at work to his people in the world. As you listen to his lesson, notice how the promised land is not limited to a small piece of ground in Israel that right now is currently involved in fighting and a whole bunch of other things going on. Oh no. The promised land expands to include the entire world. Not the sinful fallen world that we know, but the world full of Christian believers. See, when Paul continues writing, he reveals this world-encompassing mission of God. In Paul's words, we hear an emphasis upon everyone, all people, Jew and Gentile, as he was inviting both of them to join back together in the Christian church in Rome. God's mission is is to bring his salvation to every corner of the world. And let me tell you, 
the mission is still going on thousands of years after Paul went on all his mission trips. And it's going on to the far corners of the world where we are sending missionaries and Bibles and catechism translated in their languages. We are reaching out to the ends of the earth where Christianity isn't dying like it seems to be in, here in America and in Europe and even in Jerusalem where Christianity started. Christianity is growing. Countries like Africa and Asia because that is God's mission to bring salvation to all people. And for Paul, the mission of God is not something that merely hangs there in the sky. No, Paul brings a mission of God down to earth in the very mouths of God's people. And yes, like I said, we are sending missionaries and Bibles. And in VBS, you know, we sent them, we collected money to send books and Bibles and other, uh, other things out there for people to learn about God. But it even comes back to us. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That God brings people into his kingdom through the word of faith that his people proclaim. Notice it's his people, not his pastors, not his missionaries, not his teachers. His people, Jew, Gentile, no matter who you are, his people proclaim. And Paul understands that he is part of that mission. Yes, he was called in a very special way. But it's just more than that. And yeah, he went on a lot of different missionary journeys all over, all over the place. And he wanted to stop in Rome on the way. But a stop in Rome, however, will not be one of conversation with Paul telling the Roman Christians what to believe. No, Paul anticipates that he too will hear words of encouragement and spiritual power from the Roman Christians, that he too will be uplifted and inspired. Paul knows this truth about God's greater story, that when God brings people into his kingdom, he brings them into his mission, not just to sit in the pews and to sing some nice hymns and to be on our way. Oh, no. His mission extends to the ends of the earth. And yes, I said we're reaching countries beyond what we could have imagined, beyond what Paul even would have imagined. But you know where the mission field starts? As soon as you walk out that doors. Your own backyard is a mission field. Now, yes, your backyard may be out there really in the boonies and you have no neighbors, but your backyard is Newberry, Eastern UP, all over the place wherever you travel, and go. That God gives every single one of you, every person, a confession of faith, a word of faith, that when spoken touches others with the power of God. And no, you don't need to spout off some fancy words at all. It's your everyday conversations with people. It's your everyday word. That's what touches hearts. The word of God filled with the Holy Spirit. See, Paul wants the Roman Christians to know, and you to know, as God's people today, to know that you have a purpose, a purpose in God's kingdom. God uses you in his mission to share with others the good news. And Dolly's painting offers a visual reminder of this work of God. There, in the heights of heaven, is the cross. Jesus in love offering his life for the whole entire world. And there below him is the world. It extends outward, across the lake, into a distance. This love of God is a love that will reach the ends of the earth. The question, however, is how is this love to commu be communicated to all of these people? How will God make his saving love known? And there, I know you can't see it, but the very bottom of the picture are actually two men. Two men going about their task of fishing near the boat. They seem to be plain men, fishermen, knowing nothing more than how to fish. And yet, this is what happens in the ministry of Jesus. 
He comes and calls plain fishermen, plain people who know nothing about scriptures as in the Pharisees or scribes knew it and call them to follow him for three years and change their lives dramatically. That then these men who only know fishing went out and continued to proclaim the word of God. These men are not sent into Rome to learn. They are invited to live with Jesus, to listen to him, to witness what he has done and tell about that, to proclaim that to other people. As they were gathered together in Pentecost, Jesus sent his Holy Spirit upon them and they became apostles to spread the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth. And I've often thought about those apostles and the challenges that was before them. These were fishermen. What did they know about public speaking? They didn't take any public speaking classes. They didn't learn all the other languages of the lands. What did they know about the intricacies? It would be like giving my little girls a box of crayons and asking them to paint our walls like the cistern chapel. God's work, however, it doesn't come through human elegance or human wisdom. It comes in the foolishness of the gospel. A story so simple that, yes, even my little girls can tell it. They know the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. Simple little words that tell people about the love of God. And a story so amazing that only God could bring it about. The work of Jesus, sending his spirit to speak through his people, I said, was not only limited to the apostles. You know, as persecutions arose in Jerusalem, the laity were scattered as the apostles stayed there, willing to die for the faith. And the laity were the ones who carried, actually carried out this message throughout the land perhaps even being the first people to speak of salvation in Rome. I'm sure their words were not the most skillful, not the most eloquent. They were probably just simple testimonies of faith. I call them God stories. That's all I have to tell people is your God story. But through their simple words, God's work of mission was done. See, it wasn't based upon them or how much they knew, or how popular they were, or how rich they were, or how elegant, or how much they knew. It was based upon God. God working through them. God's mission being done through them. And through you. Your simple words. His work is done today. You don't need eight years of schooling, special training, studying Greek and Hebrew for years, to speak of what God has done for you. As Paul writes, the word is near you, in your mouths, in your heart. God has called you, chosen you to be his people who live by his promise and live for his purpose, his mission to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And after the visitor had attacked Dolly's painting, it was removed from the art museum. And through careful, careful work, the painting was restored. And over time, it was brought back to the museum, where people, again, can see it today, as thousands of visitors go to Gaslow to see his painting. And they stand there and marvel at the beauty of Dolly's work. But Paul, however, knows of another restoration, a bigger restoration, a better restoration, that causes God's people to stand there and wonder. Not at a painting, even though, yes, paintings are nice. And we have a lot of the uh, banners that were done by the ladies here, too, that are wonderfully done. But we stand in further wonder that Paul sees that in Christ, God has fulfilled his promises to Abraham and Moses and to all people. That through this one nation, God has brought salvation to all the nations of the earth. And through this one person, his son, Jesus Christ, God has offered a love that encompasses all people. So as we come, as we are worshiping here today, Paul asks us to stand here, to look up, see the cross, see Jesus. But don't only just see Jesus and not worry about anything else. No, Paul changes our perspective so that we see Jesus saving us 
but we see Jesus at work through his people bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. And Paul wants us to catch that vision. It catches your breath and causes you to cry out and wonder how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Amen. Now may the love of God our Father guard your hearts and minds in our Savior Jesus Christ as he fills you with the Holy Spirit to be his people, the promise and the purpose to proclaim his word. Amen. We rise now as we join in confessing together and to each other, with each other, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now join in singing the Canticle, hymn 941.
continue with the Kyrie. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, preserve us from all harm and danger, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish what you have want done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray to you for this day for Resurrection Lutheran Church of Sand Lake for our nation and those who serve, for those who need healing, those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, and those coming to Lord's table today, confident of your promise to hear and answer us. <clears throat> o Lord our God, we do not presume to know your ways or inform your judgment. We ask you to grant us your Holy Spirit so that we may, ap ap we may apprehend your ways and know your Son, Jesus Christ, by faith. Give us wisdom that we may trust in your word amid the stormy seas of this mortal life and be safely delivered from all danger onto the eternal shores of heaven. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we have no righteousness of our own, but only the righteousness of Christ. Bless Resurrection Lutheran Church of Sand Lake, its mission and its people, its leaders and its pastor, giving them the ability to meet the needs that arise as they do the work you have given them to do in proclaiming the saving truth of your word. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we ask you to bless us, our nation, and those who lead us. Guide all elected and appointed civil servants in their judgments, that we may know justice in our land and peace among the nations. Make us especially mindful of those who need our special protection, the unborn, the aged, and the oppressed. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we remember the sick, those who suffer, those troubled in mind, those plagued by the pandemic and virus, those who are grieving and those who are dying. Hear us especially for those named in our bulletin and those whom we name in our hearts. <clears throat> Deliver them according to your will and grant them the comfort of your word and their afflictions that they may depend upon your mercy in every circumstance. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord, our God, we are daily and richly surrounded with your love and care. Bless those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, including Ruth Liss, Hilary Newby, and Pat and LaShawn Edwards, that as they celebrate another year of life for marriage, continue to watch over them, providing for all their needs and granting them joyful celebrations. Grant them another year of life for marriage to come if it be your will, so they may continue to cherish, grow, and abide in your love and saving grace. Lord, in your mercy. 
O Lord our God, we do not presume to come to this your table trusting in our own merits. Give to us faith to discern Christ in his body and blood, and repentance that we may receive for our good his gift of himself in this blessed communion. What we have received with our lips, help us keep in holy, upright, and godly lives to share with others. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord our God, we pray you to be our light in darkness, our strength in weakness, our courage and fear and our peace and distress. Speak to us by the voice of your word, that we may call upon you in the day of trouble and confess your saving name before all people. Hear us on behalf of ourselves and those for whom we have prayed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, mighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right? And so I tell you, we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of Virgin Mary. For our sake, he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all those in heaven, we log to magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Jesus Christ, and I was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them all, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is in the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of our Lord be with you always.
song and none too many. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in your loving kindness sent your only Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your great people. Will always rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may with beautiful feet share your good news with those who need to hear it. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, our God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and fill your hearts with his everlasting peace. May we see as we join lifting our voices to our Savior with him 523, O Lord of O Word of God incarnate.
Yeah, blessed morning to you all on this beautiful day. Uh, again, um, the script order, we're still collecting those today. They will go in this week, and so we will have those for next week, Sunday, to hand out. So if there's more script you want to order, if you have an order script, the forms are on the back table in the, in, um, the back of the church, and you can just place them in the offering basket to be counted. Today, after fellowship hour, we have just a council gathering to look at some things coming up, especially the plan for the fall. Uh, so we're going to look at those things. And it's in the bulletin, but I just want to make mention of it. Feeding America is going to be August 20th. It's a Thursday, and it's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning because it's a different one. It's still Feeding America, but it's through a different way than what we've been receiving. And so, again, that's going to be a Thursday, 10 o'clock, August 20th. And before that, though, we invite you to join us downstairs for our little fellowship hour uh, with treats and goodies and coffee and juice downstairs as well. Oh, but one other thing. Remember, um, you know, this year has been, been a year, and the graduates, um, you know, they didn't quite get their uh, graduation and the end of the school year, and then they did, at least for ours, you know, they had it last, the end of last month out in the football field, um, and we had five graduating from our church, and, you know, we blessed them and sent them out, and we gave them little uh, gifts. Well, Lucas wrote us, uh, thank you, Lucas uh, Martin, that's um, Kitty's grandson, he wrote us a thank you. It says, just want to thank you and ask the Lord to shower you with his blessings. Thank you, Lucas Martin. I want to share that with you. I'll pray on the back table. And again, pray for them because now they're going to be going out to college. Maybe, maybe not this year. And pray for all the kids as, you know, and the parents too and teachers as we contemplate what's going to happen with school uh, this fall. And pray for everyone as we go in peace with beautiful feet. <laughs>